Hello and welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, a podcast where we discuss all things relating to your well-being, including interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health and my 5-Minute Food Fact series. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a nutritionist with a passion for well-being. Before I introduce today's guest, I will take a moment to let you know that you can subscribe to my podcast on YouTube, hit the red subscribe button, or on your favourite podcast app, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify or Google Podcasts. I will also mention that although I will often be speaking with experts, any information or advice provided in Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast is not intended to be used to treat, cure or prevent injuries or medical conditions. And it is not a substitute for advice from your own health professional. Today I am here with Chris Chapman. Chris spent years in the retail and wholesale sporting industry in Adelaide and London and Sydney before he started up his own company called The Running Company. He established that in 2009 with the first store at Bondi Beach in Sydney. Chris started The Running Company because he wanted to provide premium footwear, honest advice and superior service to runners of all levels, ultimately helping them to achieve their running goals injury free. So we're going to speak to Chris about how he managed to do that and some of the important things about remaining injury free when you're running. I'm sure it's no surprise to hear that Chris is a pretty keen athlete himself. He runs, he cycles and I believe he's also an Ironman athlete so we'll talk about that too. Before I launch into my chat with Chris, I just wanted to share something interesting with you that I read about. So um, on October the 15th, the Global Wellness Institute, which is a non-profit research and educational resource for world for the world wellness industry, released a major research report for 2019 titled Move to be Well, the Global Economy of Physical Activity. So the report found that the physical activity economy, and that means sports and active recreation, fitness like joining a gym, mindful movement like yoga and pilates and apparel and footwear is valued at 828.2 billion globally. That's that's staggering. 134.6 billion of that is attributed to footwear. So that should make someone like Chris pretty happy. And another interesting fact in the report that I like to read was that Australia and Taiwan lead the world in terms of participation in physical activity with a rate of 84% of the population participating. So that's another heartening bit of news. Hi, Chris, or chicken, I think it's um, what you're called. G'day. (laughs) G'day. Thank you for coming on my podcast. I did have to ask Chris when he arrived why he was called chicken, and to tell you what, it's pretty obvious. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, as I said before, if I was wearing shorts, you would have got it right away. I got the runner's legs. Yeah, lucky you. (laughs) Yeah. I should be called elephant. (laughs) I'll I'll take calves any day. I'd love a a good set. (laughs) So, Chris, you established the running company in 2009 with your first store at Bondi in Sydney. Yeah, that's where I was living at the time. Cool. And now you have 10 stores all over Australia, which is very cool. Yeah, thank you. So, can you tell us, first of all, about your career path? So, what led to you founding the running company? Um, I suppose it was a, a number of factors, to be honest with you. So, yeah, I grew up here in South Australia. Um, I started working retail at Belletti Sports uh, on Hindley Street oh, right. back in the day. Uh, and whilst I was working there, I was studying marketing and IT at university, uh, graduated from uni and then just had the bug. I had the itch. I got to travel. So I just, South Australia was is beautiful, but it just felt like it was too small for me. So I was really fortunate. My parents actually gave me a um, ticket to go to Europe and I traveled around Europe for three months, just backpacked around by myself and had a couple of mates um, from university and everywhere that I went and visited. And it was amazing. I absolutely Mm -hmm. loved it. So I came back, I think it was Christmas Eve uh, and in 1999 
And it, it was great to be back home. But again, I just felt the urge and the itch. So I uh, ended up working at Rowan Jarman, which was a, a store back here in South Australia yeah, back in the day. Is that still around? No, no I didn't got think bought so. out by Rebel Sport Neymar oh, quite okay. some time ago. So. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, but anyway, that's all yeah. cool. Uh, and so, yeah, I was working on the shop floor selling shoes there as well. So, uh, and I just loved like running shoes and football boots and mm-hmm. just footwear in general. I had a real, just, I don't know, I just had a passion for yeah. it. I loved it and just working with people. And uh, I did that to pretty much earn enough money so I could go back to Europe. And when I was working on the shop floor at Rowan Jarman one day, I'd actually made the decision, yep, I'm going back to London. And uh, this guy came in and he worked from Nike and he was uh, it was a product line manager and his name was, oh my goodness, I can see him right now. <laughs> Holy heck. Mental blank. Yeah, big time. Um, Struth, big unit. He ended up working for Puma. Oh, I'll get his name. I'll yeah. Tell you. But such a, it. he was just such a good guy. And um, Paul Crow. Oh, there, there you go. go. Sorry, Done. Crowy. I apologize, mate. <laughs> uh, yeah, such a good guy. And I, I was talking to him and I just said, oh, well, uh, I'm about to finish up here soon. I'm going to go to London and go and live over there. And he said to me, oh, well, I know the HR manager at Nike Town. Do you want me to send her an email? I was like, that'd be amazing because I don't have anything lined up. And so he sent her an email. Her name was Frances Bell. She was the HR manager at Nike Town. And uh, she sent me a note and she was like, when you hit London, come and say good day. Wow. Um, you were lucky. Should, yeah, yeah. I should have something lined up for you. So I was like, cool. So I ended up rocking up to London after being drunk for a couple of days, hanging out <laughs> with my old uni mates and stuff. And that next Monday, I, I waltzed up to Nike Town and, uh, and met my then, who would be manager, Simon Underwood. Such a, an amazing guy. Uh, had an interview and he said, cool, you start in two days time. Wow. Uh, and I was stoked. Turned out that it was just myself and one other, there's actually two other Aussie guys there at the time. Um, and one, uh, his name is Dean Robinson. He would actually become a really close mate of mine. He ended up running a ton of Rebel Sports stores around Australia oh, cool. later on down the track. But uh, yeah, I ended up working there for almost a year. And it was amazing. Um, it was so good to have experience having worked at Belletti Sports with football mm-hmm. boots uh, and a small family business. Rowan Jarman in a bigger business. And then now Nike from a a global pinnacle yeah. top end premium retail model was absolutely amazing. Um, so taught me a lot about myself, got to travel a lot as well, yeah. got to really learn and differentiate different service levels mm-hmm. and just see some product. And I just loved it and embraced yeah, it. And fantastic. Yeah. I, um, I tried to, I tried to stay in London, but my visa wouldn't allow it. So I pretty much almost got kicked out, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, and while I was there, just before I knew I was going to leave, uh, there was an intranet and I saw there was a job in Melbourne and uh, it was for a, what we call a product line coordinator in, at Nike in the head office. So I sent the HR manager there an email as well and she was like, all right, you've got a marketing degree, cool. You've had this retail experience, mm-hmm. cool. Um, that's pretty much what we're looking for for this oh, type of perfect. role. Come on home. Uh, so flew back home, got back to Australia. I was in Adelaide for about a week and they flew me over to Melbourne. Went to Melbourne, had an interview, said, yep, I could pretty much do everything. So I moved to Melbourne, Um, ended up living in Melbourne for three years, met some amazing mates Mm -hmm. uh, that I lived with in what would be called the frat house. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I learned a lot about life there and just, yeah, I worked as a product line coordinator for there for three years in Melbourne and just so very fortunate. Um, We have a lot of mutual friends from Mm -hmm. what we just discussed Yes, who were at Nike at the time and um, yeah, as a product line coordinator, I managed all the footwear samples, the costings of the product, uh, all the tools that the sales team for Australia and New Zealand needed from a footwear Mm -hmm. standpoint um, and the the catalogs those days that would be produced i would do that as well oh, right. so now online. it's online now. everything's yeah. online now so yeah my role would have very much been different mm. uh, today as what it was back then um and then from that my next role was what they call Eakin, which is nike spelt backwards and that's a medical and technical rep oh okay yeah so um there was only three Eakins uh, at that time so in australia and we live in one of the most technical marketplaces in the world because we have so many physiotherapists and podiatrists yes so um retail necessarily isn't that technical or wasn't that technical back then um because we just had say athletes foot some small um independent running stores that didn't do any gait analysis or anything but um 
Yeah, so um, I met my then mentor who is, and my boss then, but who's one of my best mates, Scott mm. Nicholas. Uh, he came over from the US and was the Eakin manager at the time. And I learned a heck of a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned a lot about footwear design development. And also uh, another part of the job was trying to train retail staff. Yeah. So I suppose I got two things out of that. One was that um, I knew how much time, effort and energy was going into being to make one specific shoe which was for a certain person and a Mm -hmm. certain running style and mechanics and then number two i learned how much of that information was actually being given to the consumer at retail yeah next to none yeah Uh, and that's because uh, retail staff the turnover of retail staff was simply amazing i would go in there to speak to staff on a shop floor at one store uh, and i'd speak to them I go back in the next week and it's a different person. Oh, right. Yeah. So if there's no consistency in your retail staff, well, then how do they get to build a knowledge base to then help the consumer who comes in the front door? Mm. They simply don't, uh, which is really hard because that just shows that there's no real love for the consumer. It just yeah. means that the person who owns that store is just trying to make as much money as soon as possible by, by paying a lower hourly rate so they can get cheap staff in mm-hmm. so the focus isn't on the customer yeah. and then i suppose secondarily to that those stores that actually did have a consistent uh service offering from from people that stayed around were actually selling a lot on incentive so a lot of the brands would actually oh, okay. sell everything on incentive so um i would go in one day and if there was an incentive for a different brand being offered that incentive would be anything from macbook airs ipads uh, iPhones um, to cash. So, mm-hmm. so for example, if it was cash, if you sold, uh, if you're a staff member uh, and you sold a pair of shoes for say two hundred dollars, you would get five dollars cash. If there was uh, an an add-on to that sale, so say it was an inner sole uh, or a pair of socks, you would then get another five dollars cash. So. Put it this way: if you're a staff member and you're going to university and you're on say twenty dollars an hour. And you serve two people within that hour and each of those people, you actually sell them the product that is being advertised and incentivized for that month. And you also sell them a pair of socks. You do that twice an hour. You've doubled your hourly wage straight away. Oh, that's pretty scary as a consumer. Yeah, because you think about it. Yeah, Mm. yeah. Because it means that, okay, well, they don't actually have your best interests at heart. No. The, The person that's selling the shoe all they care about it's not really about you who walks in the front they just care about how much money they're making yeah and that was the business model that had been set up by a number of retail mm. outlets here in australia and i found that really channel challenging to be honest with you because there actually isn't any ethics around that and there's yeah. no care for the consumer it's all about okay well how can we make as much money mm. as soon as possible and the focus isn't on the runner the focus is on the staff member or the store owner yeah uh, and that just really confronted me, to be honest with you. That blew me away. So after Eakin, uh, I had I was lucky enough to still be with Nike and my next job role was looking after all the athletes' foot stores for Australia and New Zealand. So I was the national account manager mm-hmm. for those two. Uh, and again, I suppose that's where I learned more around the sales side of things yeah. and, um, and how a business operates and how... Yeah, what the what the back end mechanics are of like profitability of a store, stock turns, product, staff, all that sort of stuff. When I was working for Nike as the account manager for the athletes foot, I was doing a lot of traveling um, and a lot of regional traveling mm-hmm. as well. And it sort of wore me down a little bit to yeah. be honest with you because I love traveling so much, but then I started to sort of resent it a little bit. There's a big difference I think between traveling for work and traveling for fun. You nailed it. Yeah, because right. I used to travel a bit yeah. in my work job yeah. years ago, and it's not fun. No. It's it's hard work. You don't really enjoy the fun side of wherever you are. Yep. It's just meetings after meetings. Spot on. Yeah, mm. yeah. And it's it's pretty tiring. It um, is. And I put, I put everything into what I do, but I firmly believe if you're going to do something, you do it right, yeah. and you have a real good crack at it. And yeah, I, I worked my butt off, and uh, I absolutely loved it. But it definitely wore me down. Mm. And the tipping point for me was I went out, I had a a call from a store, I think it was like in Tamworth or Armadale or something in regional New South Wales. And it was about a five hour drive from where I was living at Bondi at the time. And 
they said, we're brand new store owners, we need help. And I was like, cool, I'll be the first person there. So I got up at three in the morning, drove out there, got there early early doors so I could um, I could be with them and mm-hmm. we could talk before the, the store had opened. And they were asking me all these questions. They were brand new and they were really fresh. They'd had no idea about the athlete's foot. They had no idea about the industry. They had no idea really about anything, to be honest with you. And it really scared me. And it showed me that the questions they were asking was like, well, what's the difference between a running shoe and a how many staff members should we have? And I was scratching my head going, are you kidding me? You're asking yeah. me all these questions and you've bought into this business. And I just said, I'm, what are you doing here? Like, why did you buy this? And they just said, oh, I think it was either Baker's Delight or Captain's News. They said, oh, the, the Baker's Delight franchise was taken in town. So oh. we're, we bought this. Oh, and okay. I was like, oh my goodness. So, and I drove away and that was it. That was my tipping point. I was like, this person, they might have the money, but they don't have the knowledge. Yeah. I knew that I had the knowledge, but I didn't have the money. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh my goodness, I have to make this work. So I had five hours to drive home and I was driving home and it was all going through my head. I was like, I knew what I'm going to do because mm-hmm. I'd seen retail in the US, I'd seen it in Europe. Uh, and I, I was just literally, it took me about another six to 12 months to build the business plan, taking the best parts of the highest levels of service, mm-hmm. um, using just the ethics and honesty that I'd, I'd been sort of that had been instilled in me from yeah. birth from home and um and just trying to find the best parts of running specialty retail globally and then bring it back to australia and elevate it to the next level mm-hmm. uh, and that's what i did i just kept on building the, and refining cool. this business plan while i was still working at nike and uh and over a 12 month period just Every night I'd get it out and I'd do another bit and I'd refine it and I'd learn more and I'd do a profit and loss. I built my cash flow. I was like, you know what? I might be able to make this work. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, there was a lot of of hard work that went into it. Yeah, I bet. And how did you find the first location? Uh, It was literally, I'd say... 400 meters from my front door. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I walked past it. So it was on uh, Gould Street in Bondi mm-hmm. Beach. It looked really good at the time because there was actually a pub and a bottle across the road. But then at the same time, that pub and bottle it was a drive through it was actually being demolished. Oh, so... Yeah. So, but I'd made the decision internally within myself to say, I need to do this. Yeah. If I don't do this... I will regret this for the rest of my life. So it was too late. I'd already internally made this decision. Mm -hmm. I'd written the business plan. Uh, I found a site. It was expensive. I knew nothing. Especially at Bondi. Uh, It was 40 square meters, including storage. Right. Uh, I knew nothing about real estate retail. Mm. No one to guide me. No one to go, oh, you should ask for a few months rent free or anything like that. No one to help me with negotiation, any of this stuff. I was so wet behind the ears in that regard of things. But I knew my I knew my industry and mm-hmm. I knew retail, I knew the market space. So yeah, I think it was about three and a half to four thousand dollars a month for forty square meters wow. of rental in Bondi with a building site across the road. <laughs> so walk past traffic, there was a little bit, but there wasn't a ton. It's gonna work. And you'd obviously been working at it for a long time. Yep. So it wasn't a, you know, fly by the night decision. No, not at all. Mm. Yeah, this had been 12 months brewing essentially. And, uh, well, it'd been, you know, what, ever since I started selling shoes at Belletti Sports all the way through to opening that, that was that was essentially my training uh, using, it sounds bad, but using other people's money yeah. uh, to learn as much as I can about retail so that I can then go ahead and open my own retail yeah. space. I don't know what it was that was inside of me. I know that my two of my grandfathers both had their own businesses. My dad had his own business. And now it was my turn to have my yeah. own business. So, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You've kind of answered this, but maybe just if we really sort of drill down on what makes the running company different from other yeah. shoe shops or sports uh, shops? Yeah, a heap of different things. So first of all, as soon as you walk in the door, um, manners are free. They don't, yes. they don't cost you anything and I'm really hot on it. And it's just a, a smile and it's hi, how are you? Secondarily, the sole focus of us in store is the person that walks in the front door. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what size, what shape, what color. Yeah. Um, 
running is something that is a sport that is there's no discrimination in it yeah it's like, that's one of the things i we all love run. about it yeah we all run and bill bowman had one of these there was there was two oh, quotes yeah. that i came from nike uh, and were really drilled into me as well. One was, and I love it. Um, one was, if you have a body, you're an athlete. Yeah, I like that too. And that is, that's it. It's like everyone gets treated exactly the same, no matter who they are, how much they run. Because yeah. we all go through different things when we run. It might just be at different paces and different times. Mm. Uh, secondarily, the one from Nike was, if you do the right thing, money will make itself automatically. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's just, and you know what? It does. It's yeah. like if you always just do the right thing, you won't have a problem. Yeah, good and service. Yeah, and the way I look at it is if I go for a run and I'm on the start line and I look down to the person next to me and they've purchased a pair of shoes from me, but if they've had a bad experience, how does that make me feel? Mm. I would feel just like horrible. So like we live in a small world. Yeah. And Adelaide's a small town in particular very as well. very small. Mm. And so... Just do the right thing. Yeah. It's not really hard. So I suppose there are a couple of key, key things that differentiate straight away. It's just about people. Mm-hmm. The reason why I started the business again is it's all about people. And it's about the person that walks in the front door. Uh, secondarily, we do a full in-depth, full-blown gait analysis. Yeah. And it's not just something that's static. It's not taking a picture of pressure just statically. Yeah. It's not just walking down and, and someone eyeballing it. It's about... Um, asking as many questions as possible, finding out what people's goals are, having a look at their injury, having a look at their previous shoes or injuries if they've had them or their injury history, having a look at their shoes, how they currently work and function and then getting people on the treadmill. Um, The biggest thing for us is reassessing the effect of the shoe on the foot because when we look at how the shoe functions, then you can see, okay, well, this one's functioning this way. This one's giving you the right amount of support. This one is actually under supporting you. I mean, a lot of people, unfortunately, people just buy shoes. They don't know how they work. Yeah. Uh, and that's just because of the retail models that have been established for years and years. No one will show you how your shoes work. They'll tell you, oh, okay, well, you might be neutral. But of neutral shoes, you might have 10 different styles yeah. and they all function differently. So how do you know which one works best? So if you reassess the effect of the shoe on the foot and you can show someone how they physically work, then you're not hiding anything. Everything's open and honest and... You're taking the gamble out of it. I mean, would you go and buy something for two hundred dollars if you didn't know how it worked? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I personally love the running company. Every single shoe I've bought from there, which has been quite a lot, yeah, over you the have years, bought a bit. Thank you for your support. I appreciate <laughs> um, it. Has been brilliant, and I've also, it's also given me the confidence to try new shoes. Yes, that's because what it's about. in the past I would find a shoe I like through trial and error and just stick to that shoe yep. no matter what. But then when I went to the running company, I thought, you know, maybe I could try a different style of trail running shoe. And um, yeah, so now I have two pairs of trail running shoes for slightly different terrain, um, my road running shoes and my triathlon shoes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's very important to have the right shoe. Oh, you go. Yeah, yeah. And they're all very different. And that's the thing because the good thing about that is they're challenging different muscles and different fits. You're going to help you run a different way. and, And people change. Uh, and their feet change as well, and the shoes change. So when someone walks in our door uh, at one period of time, a certain shoe might be right for them. Mm-hmm. But 12 months later down the track, they may or may not have been doing less or more training. So as a result, their body will be different. Their musculature will be different. Their strength will be different. Uh, and their goals might be different. Yeah. So every single time someone comes in, it's not just, oh, you've had that before. We'll just give you the next one and not do anything. It's like, yeah. actually... We need to reassess everything and we need to have a good look at it and see how it is. And and so I, I think when we reassess the effect of the shoe on the foot, that's 50% of the equation. The other 50% is your own body and fit and feel mm. because our bodies are really smart and especially our feet. And if we listen to our bodies, nine times out of 10, we'll get it right. Yeah. Uh, but if we combine the two of the full digital gait analysis, reassessing the effect of the shoe on the foot, spending time with people, And then giving people a short list of shoes that are functioning really Mm. well. But then from that, then they go, okay, well, out of these shoes, you tell me which one fits and feels the the best. It's almost like a blind test. Yeah. And the shoe that you don't necessarily notice on your foot uh, or the shoe that feels the most comfortable is is 
that's the shoe because yeah. you want to go for a run and not think about what's on your foot. You want to go for a run and enjoy it. You want to think about, okay, well, what I'm going to make for dinner tomorrow night or yeah. <laughs> what's, what, yeah. am I going to have a beer afterwards? Or no, it's just, yeah, it's just about running's different things for different people. And I find it very meditative. So do and, I. Um, yeah, if I can just zone out and forget about what's on my feet, but really enjoy just the experience of just going for a run, that's what it's all about so yeah and another thing that i found sort of exciting for want of a better word was um last time i went to the running company i um i ended up coming out with a pair of hawkers yes and i had tried the very first sort of incarnation of hawkers when i lived in hong kong with a massive massive um soul and i didn't really like them so in my head i sort of thought i don't ever want to buy those shoes again yeah but then, um, you know, we talked about what I was doing and I just had a try and I thought, oh my gosh, these feel amazing. Yeah. And they are quite different from mm. the original ones. And I love them. Yep. Yeah. And I never would have sort of had the confidence, I think, to put on a hocker again. Yeah. But no, I love them now. And that's our job. Our job is to make sure that we curate the best range of shoes for every person that can walk in our front door Mm. um it's the reason why we only do running so we get asked so often um do you do netball do you do football do you do cricket do you do cross trainers like well no we don't because if we do all of those other shoes well then we don't have enough money to put aside to make sure that from a running standpoint we cover off every single base so that nine times out no, no, 10 times out of 10, someone that walks in our front door will have something suitable for them that they're really going to love. Yeah. And try different types of shoes, as you said, like a hoka. So um, the footwear designers and developers, they move between the brands all the time. And um, Brooks is a really good example. So they've recently had the Adrenaline 18 that's mm-hmm. moved to the Adrenaline 19. And they're two completely different shoes yeah. from a functional standpoint. And so as a result of that, we need to be across that. And because that function will change how the foot functions within that shoe and if a consumer has been in the 18 and had a really good experience and they've been in the 17 and the 16 and the 15 and my wife is actually one of those the 19 might not be right for them yeah i've found Mm. that as well with some asics i used to wear yep Mm, Yep. they change them yeah and we need to be across that so that we can make sure that when we make product recommendations to people that uh we give them the the complete open and honest package of Mm. okay this is the change in the shoe. Let's try it out for you yeah. and we'll give it a shot and see how it works. It may or may not be right for you, but you know what? Let's have a go at it and yeah. see how we go. And outside of that, here are some other options which have changed and they might now suit you too. So, And one of the things you say is that choosing the right shoe helps prevent injury. So can you talk to us a bit about sure. that? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, think about someone who's got uh, Achilles issues. So they have put a lot of pressure on their calf and their Achilles. But if you put someone in a quite a low drop shoe, like Mm -hmm. a a four mil pitch shoe or something like that. Just before you go on, can you explain what that is? Because not everyone's going to know. Sorry. So (laughs) a standard heel to toe offset in a running shoe is usually uh, around 24 millimeters at the back and 12 Mm -hmm. at the front. So you have what we call a 12 mil heel to toe offset or Mm -hmm. differential. So that means that your heel's 12 mil higher than your forefoot. And if that's what you've been used to running in for quite some time, happy days. Um, sometimes if it ain't broke, don't try and fix mm. it. But um, make sure that when we talk to people about shoes, if there is a change, we need to know about it and yeah. we need to tell them about it. So if one of those people come, one of those people, they come through our front door and say they have some calf and Achilles issues, and then we go and put them in a, or someone goes ahead and puts them in a four millimeter offset shoe. So say you've gone from uh, 2412 mm. to like 2420, then the heel is sitting a lot lower. Yeah. So mechanically, you're actually putting a lot more tension and pressure mm. on the calf and the Achilles. And as a result of that, if the person is upping their training load and not giving their body a chance to adapt and adjust to that mechanical change, you can really overload someone's calf and Achilles and flare up either an underlying Achilles issue, or um, uh, yeah, or and or I mean, bring out even even more so if they've got yeah. an existing Achilles issue that's right there, you're going to flare it up even more. So that's the reason why you need to be really careful and you need to listen to people yeah. and find out as much information as possible. Um, 
before making, I suppose, wholesale changes or mechanical changes. Yeah. And we find a lot of people come and they go, oh, I want to try this shoe. And it's like, well, okay, we can try that shoe, but let's listen to you first. I want to mm. find out more around your injury history, what your goals are, because everything with the body is about progressive adaptation. And it's the same with training and loads and things. You need to progressively adapt and adjust. And it's like the old 10% rule. So when someone's in a shoe, we won't take them from one extreme to the other because if you do that, you open the door to injury. Yeah. And our job is to help people improve their running or enjoy their running, but keep them on the good side of injury free as well. So if someone came in with an Achilles problem yep. and they were currently in a four mil drop shoe, then yep. maybe you'd put them in a... 12 million. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, fix, yeah. Address that. Yeah, and the other thing is we work closely with a lot of physiotherapists, yeah. podiatrists, osteos, chiros, etc., uh, massage therapists. And so I would highly, highly, highly recommend um, referring someone to one of those trusted mm. practitioners that we deal with. We're so fortunate in South Australia. We have a ton of really talented people here yeah. that, um, that we have very good relationships with, that we know and trust, who I've personally seen myself for those mm. sorts of issues. And I will refer them to that because footwear is one component of someone's overall well-being. Yeah. And if we get that right, well, then that's great. We can eliminate that as a contributing factor towards injury. But if we don't then work around, say, someone's got existing calf tightness mm. or say their hips are out of, their pelvis is out of whack or say, um, yeah, they, they might need orthotics or anything else. We need to make sure that those are being addressed as well because yeah. if you only fix one thing, we're well, not going to solve the problem as a whole. So we like to then refer onwards to our trusted partners so that that person can actually find a long-term solution to their injury or injuries and then enjoy what they do and, yeah. and, and just run and, and walk and be active and set a good example for their family and just be a better person, I suppose. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. I don't know. I'm a better person if I run. Oh, so I, am I. If I get out and do something, I'm a really good guy. I'm a grumpy <laughs> yeah, if I don't. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I know you run, but I think you also cycle and you've also done some Ironman. So yep. can you talk to us a bit about yeah, your sure. training and what you love doing and yeah. what motivates you to do all of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I never grew up running, to be honest with you. Uh, growing up in South Australia, I grew up playing basketball, yeah. um, Norlunga City Tigers back in the day <laughs> for 10 years, from like under 10s to uh, under 20s, uh, and then uh, started playing soccer. So I went from the hand to the foot and yeah. yeah, played soccer for years and years as well, and that was amazing. Uh, I only started running really when I worked at Nike Town London because I stopped playing team sports, and at Nike Town they had a, um, a running group on a Tuesday oh, night. Perfect. And one of the guys asked me, he's like, oh, would you like to like help us out? I was like, yeah, for sure. So I'd take like a hundred odd runners for a run oh, around brilliant. Hyde Park and all that. And that's actually how I got into running mm. the first time. Uh, and it stuck with me. Um, and so, yeah, I'd always run. And then, um, as I said, Scott Nicholas, who was my Econ manager, turns out he's like a 218 marathoner. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, ran track at, for the University of Oregon, oh, worked for cool. Nike for years and... Um, it's just one of the humblest, most nicest guys. And we're so for fortunate to still be very good friends, but have him as a part of the running company mm -hmm. family as, as a business development manager now. But uh, he actually got me into like marathons. And so, yeah, I started running marathons. Cool. And um, yeah, I ran my first marathon was 302. My second one with a bit of help from Scott was like 255 oh, in Melbourne. Wow, and that's then awesome. my third one was 246. And then I've like hung the boots up after that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Why wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I was pretty that's happy. That's perfect. <laughs> oh yeah, I went out a high note. I thought, oh, well, I, ended up, I was so fortunate. It was um, it was Adelaide Marathon and no one else was quicker than me on the day. So I was lucky oh, to get, a, get the win. And brilliant. I was like, all right, no worries. But the only problem was they weren't very organized and there was no photographer. So oh. did, did you at least get a medal? Uh, I got a medal. Yeah. Cool. Well, it wasn't, it was this glass thing that was cool, <laughs> but yeah, I, I got that and my name in the paper and cool. yeah, I was pretty stoked. But yeah, after that, then I just started helping other people mm. run to achieve their goals. So yeah, I just, then from that, um, I just wanted to challenge myself a little bit more and got into triathlon where I was living at the time in Bondi. There's the, the Brats, the Bondi oh, okay. running and triathlon club. And, um, I just started doing triathlons with my mates and loved the challenge of I could surf so I could swim okay. Um, not amazing, but I could get around Good and be enough, confident. Yeah. yeah, get around. And then um, the bike is a real art form. Yeah. Yeah, it took me a while to learn the bike and to get strength in the that's legs. That's the thing. I'm. That's my weakest yeah, leg because yeah, it's the yeah. thing I've done the least. Yep. And it's it takes hours yeah. and years of practice and 
confidence and yeah it's it's amazing though i was really yeah. fortunate i was surrounded by some really good coaches and people in bondi and we um yeah got me to do my first iron man that was cool. in cairns i learned a lot oh, that's about where myself. i did i oh, only awesome. did the half but yep. gosh that was fun yeah it was amazing yeah yeah, yeah. it's so cool up there but i um they're a bit unorganized that year because it had just changed from challenge to iron man oh, and had it? Okay. yeah there wasn't any sun cream in the tent but i oh, right. put some sun cream in my bag for the transition just thinking just in case so mm. um i remember sitting in the transition tent and everyone's like oh you got sun cream i was like yep and i put some on my face and my arms but then i was just too nice i was like giving it to everyone yeah. else and forgot my legs oh no so out of the swim uh, I got on the bike and I sat six hours on the bike. I got a puncture on the bike. I had no sun cream on. Oh. I got to the run leg and I was like radioactive, man. Oh, you poor My thing. legs That's were just lit up like Christmas trees. But um, yeah, little did I know the training group I was with at the time had bought two massive full-blown chicken outfits and suits. <laughs> and I was running down the main street of Cairns with these two guys slapping me on the bum, just yelling, go chicken, go, in full-blown chicken outfits. And there's a photo of me crossing the line with these two chickens with their arms in the air behind me. And it was amazing. It was, um, yeah, that was like Chris Hanrahan and, uh, from PB3. And I remember the boys that were doing that. That was uh pretty cool experience so yeah but i find that i suppose when i have some challenges personally um, and professionally i like to have a goal um, and so when i moved back to adelaide my goal was then to um, do melbourne ironman i thought i'm going to have another go and i trained with the lakers as i can mm-hmm. see that you've yeah, got there yeah, the yeah. Lakers training program yeah yeah, yeah. so nigel peach uh, yeah. helped with a training program for me and Again, yeah, such a good guy. Uh, I was really fortunate to be surrounded by some really good people. And the Lakers guys from down south where I was living at the time were awesome. So Yeah, like, they're great, a great bunch, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I find um, the triathlon community in South Australia is amazing. It like, yeah. doesn't matter if it's the Lakers or the media, whoever it is. They're all nice people. And they're so inclusive. Yep. And yep, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the best or the slowest. No. It, does, it really doesn't matter. Yep. And they all support one another. And, you know, yeah. I'm a massive fan of yeah, yeah, the lo- community that we I have I love here. it too. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I did Melbourne Ironman and that cool. was cool and learnt about that. But after that, that's when sort of life and kids happened and yeah. business and all that. So. And sorry, I'm jumping back that's a bit because right. I forgot to around. ask I the you. Shop too. <laughs> I forgot to ask you before. So you've gone from one shop at Bondi was your yep. original location and now you have 10. Yeah. Pretty so, crazy. Yeah, so how do you choose and, and they're not all in capital cities. Yes. You've got some yeah, regional yeah. locations. So yep. how do you choose the location? It's all about people. It is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily about a location. That's part of the equation. Mm-hmm. It's about the person. Right. So um, all of our stores are incubators for more stores. Yeah. So we don't necessarily look at a store and uh, look at an area and go, We need to have a store here. It's actually, do we have the right person? Ah, uh, interesting. Yes, we do. So say for example, um, uh, six months after I'd opened uh, the Bondi store. So Scott, who was my mentor at Nike, had left Nike. Uh, he was working for, I think it was Quicksilver. And then he did like a really small stint at Adidas. And he rang me up and he was like, I'm not liking this. And I said, funny about that. But I said, honestly, you, all of your history and knowledge, you are, has been leading you to be a running specialty mm-hmm. store owner. Like, And I've proven because I was financially viable, the store was going great, mm. it was all happening. I, I was really lucky to be embraced by just the running and sports medical community in Bondi and Sydney at the time. Um, so like Sean Williams from my old running coach and all of those guys and then all the physios and podiatrists around the area were so amazing to me as well. Um, and I said, Scotty, like I've proven it, I can do it. You can do it too. And yep. Scott was living in uh, Torquay at the time. And I was like, you know where you need to open a store? And he just said, he's like Geelong. And I said, yep, yeah, Geelong's yeah. screaming out for a store. So uh, I remember sitting in the mall in Bondi Junction with Scott and we were building our product assortment uh, for him. And I was like, Scotty, you're going to do this and you're going to make it work. And uh, so, yeah, we just went about it. Cool. And after uh, Scott opened the Geelong store, that thing went gangbusters. And I suppose it just goes to show that it's all about people. Yeah. Um, Because from then on in, Scott had a couple of really good people work for, he's had amazing people that work for him, but um, in Julian, uh, Julian Spence and Chris White, and both of those guys worked for Scott. And so they did their apprenticeship with Scott uh, over like two, three, four Mm -hmm. years. 
And then they both put their hands up at different times and said, we want to open a store. Oh, great. And I was like, cool, let's so do it. So where are those guys? So Chris is in Clifton Hill in Melbourne mm-hmm. uh, and Julian and Bree are in Ballarat. So yeah, Julian Fantastic. and Bree uh, work together under Scott. That's where they met uh, and now they're engaged to be oh. married. Um, oh, and, this is yeah. just like a fairy tale. It is, yeah. It's all about people, to be honest <laughs> with you. We're such a, a family orientated business that it's... The person that walks in the front door, one of the things I always do is I just like to offer people a drink of water because the front door for me is like the front door to our house. And you'd always yeah. offer someone a drink when they walked into your house. So I'd always like to make sure that... Just thinking, did I offer you yeah, one? Yeah, it's already sitting here. <laughs> You're ahead <laughs> of the game. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a family thing. And so yeah. all of our stores are, are pretty much owned and run by people that I have a really deep connection yeah. with and relationship with and, and that people that have... Uh, done their apprenticeship and their training so that I get asked a lot of people um, by a lot of people can I open a mm-hmm. I, want to, I want to open a running company store what do I need to do and I say well you need to move to one of where our stores are and you need to do at least a minimum of 18 months to two yeah. years in a store and after that then we'll talk about opening a store and it's that simple um, because that helps to guarantee success yeah. if they've done their apprenticeship they know what we're all about our ethics and our honesty and just our service level is part of their DNA as a result. After a couple of years, it's yeah. just been drilled into them. Um, and after a few years, you can tell if someone's the right person or not as yeah. well. And they it's, can probably tell themselves, can they exactly. as well? Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. And then they put their hand up, they're ready to go. So, yeah, it's um, it's real organic as a result yeah. of that. So. Oh, well, it certainly works. I mean, I love it. I love it. And, and so you. many of my friends go there as well. In fact, Another friend was there yesterday. Oh, awesome. Thank I you. Think, I think it was pretty busy yesterday, which yeah, is awesome. Well, she was in there with a client and then she came to meet me for a coffee. That was Helen. Helen. Yeah. That wasn't How yesterday. That was the that? day before. Yeah. Or yeah. the day before. Yes, she, it was. Yeah. I served her a client, Alice. She was so lovely and um, she'd had injury issues and stuff and she was in a pair of shoes and... Uh, and this is a, a really good example, actually, because she was in a neutral shoe and she had an orthotic and I knew her podiatrist and neutral shoe was right for her, but it wasn't the right neutral shoe right. for her. And so she was having a host of issues. And I was like, you know what? I know the shoe. So I put her in the shoe and got her running on the treadmill. I was like, how does that feel? Was, she was like, that feels amazing. I was like, funny about that. You're in the right category of shoe. Yeah. It wasn't the right shoe for her, though. And that's where you need to like really reassess the effect of the the shoe on the foot, mm-hmm. you need to have the knowledge of each of those shoes and how they fit relative, but also how they function relative yeah. to the person. We are so fortunate. We actually have um, people like Helen and other physios and podiatrists who and other trainers who will bring their clients in yeah. and not only work with us, but with the client as well. So to have two to three people focusing on one person there to help get their footwear right, to help keep them injury free... That's just that gives me goosebumps because that's yeah. the premium level of service. Yeah, that needs it's, to be it's it's the pinnacle, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I suppose. And then from that, say, uh, if Helen wasn't there, but uh, or she was, uh, Alice was referred from a physio. The thing that really wraps it up for us that differentiates us even more so is that we will then um, cut all of that footage down into say a thirty second quick time mm-hmm. file. And we will send that back to the referring practitioner, oh, fantastic. and then also uh, CC the client in on it as well. And that way, it just ensures that the practitioner knows that this person has been seen to. Mm -hmm. These are the options that were on offer. This is the one that we selected. These are the reasons why. And do you have any questions about it? And that just shows a level of openness. It shows, it closes that loop of communication and also opens the communication in the sense of, okay, well, we've done what we can. This is our best option. Um, Do you have any thoughts around it? Mm. Um, is there anything we could do better? Are you happy? Um, and just make sure that everyone's on the same yeah. page. That's that's so important because so often as a, um, a customer, you go off and see your physio, or your podiatrist or whoever, yep. and it's all sort of in isolation. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, how can things work properly if not everyone, if you know, if people aren't communicating Spot about the, the issue. Yep. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, that level of communication and everyone needs to know what one another's doing and everyone needs to be on the same page to help that person stay injury free. And so this, as you know, this is a wellbeing podcast and movement is one of the major pillars yep. of wellbeing. So just in your own opinion, how do you think running and wellbeing are connected? Oh, hugely. Like it's... 
Uh, everyone calls it like the runner's high and endorphins yeah. and things like that. But it's just the simple art of moving. Yeah. Um, if you take it back to a primitive of days, I was thinking about this the other day is like, we were hunter gatherers um, before all of this sort of stuff. And we would have to run to yeah. outlast animals to, to get our dinner mm. sort of thing. Or we'd have to walk around to go and gather things. Gather up. things. Yeah, that's it. And it's, we live in a world where we're sedentary. We're sitting on our butts and it's our glutes aren't firing anymore. Yeah. Uh, and it's the simple art of even if you just get out and do park run once or once a week or you run a couple of times a week or even if you just walk, it yeah. doesn't matter. It's that movement that just gets things moving, gets the endorphins flowing a little bit, clears the air. You're not on a phone or a device. Yeah. You're not thinking about Instagram posts or you're yeah. not... Yeah, you just have some time to breathe and meditate, mm. I suppose, is is a really good way I think about it. And it's vitally important. I mean, um, nutrition is a key important ingredient as well. I'm a big believer in that because yeah. what you put in is obviously how you're going to feel. Of course. Um, but it's that's one part to it. Movement is the other part. And it just, for me, movement is a, very, is a really big deal. And I just like to make sure that we can do everything that we can from a footwear perspective to help keep people moving. Yeah. And... That's what, that's what it's all about. If we can just keep people moving and everyone else has someone, I suppose, in their corner that helps to keep them active and be a yeah. nutritionist or a physio or a podiatrist, whoever it is, then that person has the best chance to lead a, like a, a healthy life. Yeah. And that's just what it comes down to. So Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm. Movement's so important. Yep. Just finally, I like to ask all my guests the same question at the end. And so if you could recommend two things yep. that people could do to improve their well-being... What would they be? Uh, good pair of shoes. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's the thing. I find a lot of people come in and they're like, oh, I've just started. So, or I speak to someone and like, oh, I've only just started running. I'm not worth it. Uh, and I'm like, well, really? That's yeah. actually the time when you actually need to More have More than any time, probably. Without a doubt. Yeah. People don't, I sometimes think they value themselves enough. They're like, oh, I'm not good enough. Uh, or people come in the shop and they go, oh, I'm not a runner. And I'm like, well, hang on a second. You've got a body. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it's just bring it down. Every, everyone needs to move. So if you, from my standpoint, if you have the right pair of shoes, because when you're starting training, you're increasing the load on your body. Mm -hmm. You're increasing the load on your foot, ankle, lower limb. And with the wrong footwear, that load goes in the wrong places. Yeah. So you want to make sure that if you're starting out, and you have the load going and the force and the load, uh, and it's all going in the wrong places, you're opening yourself up to injury and you're going to minimize your chance of success. Yeah. So our goal is to keep people moving in the best shoe for the longest time possible. Yeah. So if we can eliminate footwear as a contributing factor towards injury, then happy days. That person mm. increases their chance of success. So what was the question again? That was well, my <laughs> two. Two, uh, things? two things okay, yeah, so, so one, one is shoes, footwear yeah. do you have another one you don't have to uh, but... just enjoy it and and i suppose make things into a habit uh like a routine yeah so that's a good thing i suppose about park run park run is every saturday morning it's 8 a.m it's at yeah. the same spot it's the same distance it doesn't cost you anything there's a tail walker there so it's highly inclusive you don't need to run you can walk it. If you can walk five kilometers, happy days. If you can't walk five kilometers, just start out walking a couple um, and then drop out and yep. it's fine. No one's going to sit down there and look bad or talk down to mm. you or anything like that. Just move and yeah. make sure that you can try and make that into a habit, a routine, and then it becomes a part of your life. And if that becomes a part of your life and you think about if someone's never moved and uh, Steve Monaghetti told me this once, he was like, um, it's like chicken think about a, a telephone book you think about the thickness of one of the pages in the telephone book it's really thin and it's really easy to tear and rip but if you put that telephone book all together you can't rip it so think about you and training and day upon day and layer upon layer upon layer of routine and training you become so strong as a result of that so if you can put things into a routine and say you've never really walked or run but all of a sudden you've slowly built up and now you're walking two, three, four times a, a week and all of a sudden you become quite strong and yeah. resilient. And it's a habit and it's a routine and it's a part of your life. And 
before you know it, you can start to achieve things that you've never thought. We have so many people that come in and go, oh, well, I'm only doing park, I'm only doing 5Ks. It's like, well, if you can do 5Ks, I know you can do a 10K run. Yeah, if they want to. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And then before you know it, they're like, oh, I've just done 10K. It's like, yeah. yeah. How about you think about maybe 15? Think about a half marathon because you know what? You could probably do that. I think yeah. there's a pretty fair chance you can. It's just a little bit more training. Oh, I've done a half marathon. Well, <laughs> yeah, and then and if they think back to where they started, exactly, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose routine and habit would be yeah. the other thing that I would recommend, mm. and I, and that goes not only for walking and running, but also for like nutrition and, yeah. and that as well. So yeah, I think the the phone book analogy. <laughs> shows our, our age. age i was just thinking about that as soon as i said it i was like oh but there's no more phone books it's there's all no google phone books. but anyway that shows how long ago Mona and i had that conversation <laughs> oh well, that's funny but um yeah so no, if cool. um if people want to connect with the running company sure. or find you um what's the best way just website yep not the phone book anymore. No, not the phone book. <laughs> uh, the running company.com.au and then, yeah, you can click on the link and find cool. a store. And, um, yeah, we're really fortunate. Like all of our stores are just manned by people that are runners. That can, yeah, it's all thank cool. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you. I, I really appreciate your support of our small businesses. I really appreciate it. They're, they are all small businesses. Yeah. And when you purchase a pair of shoes at the running company, it doesn't go to shareholders or no. any of that. It goes to the family that is that owns the store yeah. and is helping you out and you're building that small community. It's not going to a corporation offshore or Wiggle or whatever it is. Yep. It's it's staying in the local community Brilliant. and it's helping improve our community. So yeah, yeah thank you for all thank your support. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. My cool. pleasure. And that was Chris Chapman, founder of The Running Company. You can subscribe to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. And while you're there, click on the bell to be alerted when new episodes are available. You can also subscribe on your favourite podcast app, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify or Google Podcasts. And you can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Direct links to all social media can be found on the subscribe page of my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. If you would like to contact me, you can send me a message via the contacts page on my website. Please feel free to suggest topics you'd like to learn more about and people you'd like to hear interviewed and I'll do my best to deliver that to you. Producing the podcast is a labour of love. We put in a lot of time, money and effort behind the scenes. So if you enjoy Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, and would like to make a contribution via Patreon, PayPal or by Amazon to help ensure we continue to provide you with excellent content, please visit the Contribute page on my website. Finally, please take a minute to leave a rating on iTunes. It improves visibility and will help me source excellent guests. Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.